Do you think you know who you're going to be in the future? You probably don't. That's what we're going to talk about today. The future is not something that we enter. The future is something we create. Leonard Sweet. Today we're going to talk about how you could possibly know your future self. Can we understand based on who we are today, what we're going to be like in 10 years, what we even want in 10 years, and how can we ensure that we're happy when we get to our future self? I stumbled across this in a TED Talk from a podcaster that I like quite a bit called You Don't Actually Know What Your Future Self Wants by Shankar Vedantam. He has a pretty interesting podcast called The Hidden Brain, which talks about all sorts of different things that go on in our brain, as the title says, that we just don't really know much about. And in this podcast and in this TED Talk, he was talking about how We really don't know what our future self wants because we're constantly changing. When we imagine what we're going to be like in 10 years, we think it's going to be us in 10 years. We're only 10 years older, but it is still going to be us. But the point is, if you thought back 10 years ago, what kind of person were you then? You know, I was more fearful. I stepped out less. I didn't make as many choices happen Because I was afraid to do them, I didn't know what I wanted to do, I was more confused. So 10 years ago, Jill, is related to what I came today, but it is not exactly who I am. And so if we think what our 10-year-old future self might want, it's really hard for us to guess. He mentions that when he was a boy, he loved soccer, but later in life he learned American football was his sport. And you would have told him that when he was 12. He would wonder what went wrong in his life. He would be uncomprehensible to him that he would like a different sport. Ended up going to school and becoming an engineer. But later in life, became a journalist with this podcast, Hidden Brain. And if you told him when he was in college that he wasn't going to be an engineer, it would have amazed him. He wouldn't believe it. And that made me think a lot about myself, too. If you told me when I was 12, one, that I was not going to be an astronaut, I'd be very disappointed. Two, that I wouldn't be married and have a lot of kids, which I wanted, I would have been disappointed. If you told me that I had a house and I was living on my own and things were pretty okay with me now, I would have been ecstatic and I wouldn't have believed it. But in the end, I couldn't have imagined the person I am today when I was 12. I certainly can't even imagine what I became. And even when I was in college, if you had told me this was the outcome of my life, going to college, and then this is what I've become, I wouldn't have understood quite how that happened. And I don't know that I would have been happy with that selection. I would have guessed that I would be very unhappy because I wasn't married and I didn't have kids. I would guess that I would not be happy because I'm not working in hard sciences like I hoped I would be. I would guess that I was unhappy because all the things that I built up in my head as what were mandatory things for me to have at this particular age aren't there. But you know what? I am happy. And it all came through small choices, through small steps. I got to this path. And I chose this path. The same Jill who couldn't imagine how I got here, made all the little decisions that got me to here. And that's what he's saying in his TED Talk speech as well, that he could not have imagined what kind of life he would have. He says he wouldn't have imagined that he would have a supercomputer in his pocket. He even mentions the pandemic and how we changed in even the time of the pandemic. I turned down a job as a server administrator for a company that was a plane flight away. And they told me I would be able to work from home and I would have to come into the office once a month. And I turned that job down because I couldn't imagine working at home. The whole idea sounded bizarre to me. I would get lonely. I'm an extrovert. And I would end up just like Sandra Bullock did in the movie The Net. How could I possibly work from home? But through those small choices again, And with the pandemic doing a big shove in that direction, I learned I like working from home. I never would have picked it for myself, but I really enjoyed it. And I still enjoy it. 
and it has made my life in some ways lonelier, yes, but in many other ways better. So even five years ago, I couldn't have guessed that I would have picked working from home, flying out to my customers when needed, like I do now. So it's not even like a long-term thing. Sometimes we can't even imagine the short term. Did we imagine a pandemic would happen to us? Did we imagine half the things that have happened in the last couple of years would happen? And the truth of it is, it's not something we can imagine. And therefore, if we can't imagine it, how can we possibly plan for that human being five years from now, 10 years from now? It's just safer to say when I'm having a Saturday, I better just pick for Sunday. Because at least I know, for the most part, what kind of person Jill is on Sunday, this Sunday, maybe not next Sunday. So he calls this inability to understand our future the illusion of continuity. Because if I look back in my life and I wonder, how did I get to this place in my life? I understand it. I went to college. I came out in a bad economic time. I ended up getting a job as a secretary for an office, and I really disliked it. I ended up studying so that I could get a job with Microsoft, and I see the small steps that it took me to get to the place I am today. It's a very clear line. But in the future, the problem is that we can't see those things that are happening. Hopefully, we don't have another pandemic. Hopefully, we don't have any world tragedies. Hopefully, we don't have another world war. But we don't know what's going to befall us. My grandmother lived in Lithuania as a child. She never imagined she would immigrate to two different countries, eventually get to Chicago, eventually meet her husband, eventually have him become a dentist and an apartment building owner. She never would have imagined her life. I bet you if you asked her what her future was, she was going to grow up in that town. She was going to marry someone from that town. She was going to have children, and they would be a part of that town too. It never struck her that these things would happen in her life. My grandfather, he escaped from the Russian Revolution with his two younger sisters. If you asked him what his life was going to be like, I bet you it wasn't going to be very good. He didn't have very many prospects. But when he got to the United States, he worked his way into dentistry school and became a pretty famous dentist in Chicago. So now, looking back in their lives, it makes sense. I can see the trail of their lives. But neither of them, if you ask them when they were 12 or 16 years old, what their lives would be like, they never would have guessed any of that. Schenker even talks about this woman who was a nurse, and she saw a lot of people who suffered with illness. And she asked her husband, don't ever let me go there. If something like a disease like this happens, just end me. I don't want to live life like this. And as it turns out, later in life, she ended up getting ALS, was slowly deteriorating, tried to live life the best she could, ended up going to the hospital. They asked her if she wanted to be on a ventilator, and she said, yes. Her younger self couldn't know what her future self would want, even with all the experience that her younger self had with having a disease. Shanker points out that had she been brought to the hospital unconscious, her husband would have asked for her not to be put on a ventilator and to end her life at that point. You can't know what you want until you actually cross that bridge. He says that there's another image, a thought process that you go through, which is called the ship of Theseus. And that goes back to classical mythology. You know how much I love classical mythology. When Theseus finally returns to his home and becomes the king, his ship is parked out into the shore, falls apart, and bit by bit, the ship is being put back together over the decades. New planks, new boards, new this, new that, as a way of keeping that ship alive. And so philosophers like Aristotle, he says, have talked about the question, is the ship of Theseus still the ship of Theseus if none of the parts are still any part of the original ship? Or is it a brand new ship? And that's where it comes down to us. Are we still us if each of the hopes, dreams, 
all our different body parts, they regenerate to our blood cells. Our body has a great method of replacing itself with newer parts to help us keep us healthy and live longer. But the question is, at what point is us not really us? He says in the end, we're the ship of Theseus. Our parts, our thoughts, our dreams, our hopes, our decisions that we make become new over time. They change over time. And the old things get replaced with the new things. And so we are that ship. And even with our physiology, parts of our brain is replaced with new parts of our brain, our blood cells, our skin, our tissue. There's a whole chart out there about how many things turn over in our bodies, that we're new beings all the time. What makes us still us is it is still the shape of us. It is still the shell of us. We are still the same boat, just like Theseus's boat is the same boat, because it's just replacing parts of it, but still in that same shape. It kind of reminds me when we pave over roads. There's a bump in the road that the city always comes in. And when they repave the road, they never tear the road down to the ground and then start over and repave it. Every single time they pave the road over again, that bump comes back again. And it's because it's new layers on top of new layers on top of new layers. And in a sense, that's how we go. We are always this new layer on top of ourselves. And so it makes sense from a progress point of view. He points out that when we make promises like getting married, we are committing not just ourselves to being married and staying faithful. We're promising our future self that that person whoever they may be become, is also going to stay faithful and married to that person as well. So what should we do when it comes to planning our lives about trying to prepare a future for a person we don't even know? And he says the first thing is we should, and of course will, shape the person we're going to become. He says be the curator of the person we're going to become and help that person be better than you are today. He says the first thing we should do to prepare our future self is learn from other people, learn tasks, occupations, job-related things that will help shape a better future for ourselves, help us become a better human being in the future. He says, secondly, and this comes a lot with social media, is realize that when we say something, maybe unkind, There's going to be a lot of people who disagree with us, and it may be that future person who will also disagree with us today. I've seen that so many times. I mean, you have too, where someone said something when they were 17 years old on a social media piece and then are sorry for it, don't agree with it, didn't mean it, or didn't think it out. So I think having that thought that our future self may not enjoy the things that we're doing right now. So he says that we need to add a touch of humility so that we understand that we don't know everything right now, no matter what age we are. And I'd also say to add an air of kindness in the things we say to other people, because have I ever really regretted being kind to someone? Nope, not as much as I've regretted being unkind to people. And his third step is we understand that as we get older, we're not going to be as strong, maybe as quick. And we maybe won't have as many adventures as we have right now. But you know what? We're going to be smarter. We're going to be more resilient. We're going to have different resources, different strengths to back us up. I work in a fairly young industry being in the tech world. And when I talk to people about things and ask them, you know, about their lives, and they say they always worry about getting to my age. And the thing that struck me is, that it just gets better and better. I get better and better. I get more confident. I get more ideas. I know how to execute on my ideas. When I was young, I had a ton of ideas and I had no idea how to get them. Now, when I have a great idea, I'm pretty certain that if I really want to do something, I can make it happen, as long as it's within my capabilities. So our future self may have some physical inabilities, but our future self will also be wiser and smarter than we are today. And if we tell ourselves, according to him, that there are things I cannot do, I can't start a new business, I can't start a new podcast, I can't do these things, I can't deal 
with this hard thing if it ever happened to me? But the answer is yet. You can't do them yet. But when you get there, you will grow with yourself to the point where you can do them. So he says the last step in his plan is to be brave and know that when we get to that, we will have the strength to get there. He says if we do those things, we'll be able to look back at our today self when we're in the future and not be embarrassed, not be ashamed, or not be frustrated, but instead tell ourselves, for today, thank you. There was a quote from a fellow in 1736, Joseph Butler, who said, quote, If the self or the person of today and that of tomorrow are not the same, but only like persons, the person of today is really no more interested in what will befall the person of tomorrow than in what will befall any person. I think what he's saying is we care about ourselves and our future selves because we get our future self. We understand that person. But when we find out that that future self is going to be quite different than we are today, we would probably lose interest in them and not really care at all. But a researcher called Hal Hirschfeld said that the whole idea was compelling to think about our future self. He calls it the future self continuity. He imagines two circles, one that's our current self and one's our future self. And the question is, is how much will those circles overlap? And the responses to how that will be is that people will think they overlap almost entirely, but the reality of it is that they don't overlap much at all. If we don't understand our future self and we don't care about our future self, then all sorts of things can go wrong. We may treat our body poorly. We might not even save for retirement. I don't know who that person is, just some old person who doesn't care about the things I care about. I'm young and I want to do all these things. But what we have to realize that our saving for the future or taking care of our body or eating right, doing the things like going to the doctor when we should go to the doctor and get checkups is about caring for that future self and having compassion for that future self person. And he said that people who have a high future self continuity did better at exercising, saving for money, and treating their bodies better. And that being unable to identify with our future self means that we're not going to treat our future self very well at all. They even say that the parts of your brain, when you scan the brains, if you talk about your future self a year from now, you know that person. And so the parts of your brain that lights up when you're talking about your best friend or someone you know is what lights up when you're talking about you from one year from now. But if you talk about yourself far in the future, you are talking about someone that you read about in the news. Those parts of your brain are the parts that light up because you don't even feel like you know that person. And that the way that you can go about doing this and getting to know your future self, even though, again, you won't know who your future self really is, is to start imagining your future self. Imagine what you might look like, what you might act like, about the things that you might do. And that will help you bring that future self closer back into you and closer to the person that you can understand. Even though, again, to ship a Theseus, we're not going to be that same person exactly in the same way, but we'll still be the same shape. And if you listen to Dan Gilbert's TED Talk, he talks about the psychology of the future self and this idea that when we're young or right now, we think we're changed a lot in our past. We made a lot of changes. Look at all the growth we did. Look at all the exciting things we did. But in the future, I won't change very much at all. And that is what he calls the end of history illusion. That means where we are right now is when we think change ends. Now I got myself to a good place. Jill's in a good place. She's got this podcast going. End of change. And that's just not true at all. Basically, we think change ends right now. And tomorrow is the end of history. But what's true is that we will always change. It gets slower. We change a lot when we're in our teens. We change a lot when we're in our 20s. Those changes start to slow a bit. And I think that's primarily because we have seen so many things that work, don't work. We 
finally get a grasp on what we like and don't like. A few years ago, if you had told me that I would meet someone who was a podcaster and she would be willing to show me how to have my own podcast, I wouldn't have done it. I wouldn't have had my own podcast. I wouldn't have gone out and bought the stuff to do it. I would have just, no, I'm not going to have a podcast. There's no way that's going to happen. And if I do have a podcast, I'll probably quit it in a couple of months anyway. Older me, more confident, knows how to get things done and knew how to get this done. Now I think, I'm right where Jill needs to be. I have become the person I want to become. And so that's the end of history. And it's not true. I'm going to be another person in 10 years too. Human beings are work in progress who mistakenly think they're the end product. This week we talked about the long-term future and how much we can really know about what will happen in the future. Next week we're going to talk about the short-term future and maybe some ways that we can affect our tomorrow, our next week, and maybe even 10 years from now. So my challenge to you is try to imagine yourself 10 years from now. Maybe throw in a few curveballs, a few good things that happen that are surprising, and a few bad things that happen that are surprising. Get a picture in your head. Maybe even use one of those web generators and try to get to know your future self a little bit better. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you being out there. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and tell a friend. And remember, our march to the future begins with small steps. <laughs>